The first day we had a wonderful sergeant and he said, you girls have got probably the most important job in the whole of Australia. You have to protect BHP and the port. You know, we all, you know, we're only girls. <laughs> Fortress Newcastle was the military title given to the protection of the industries of Australia here in Newcastle. Only two places in the whole of Australia were protected to any extent in the Second World War. Sydney, of course, and here in Newcastle. And what they did was they put together a network of artillery, anti-aircraft, searchlights, radar stations, and bases of fortresses of people for the reason being that Newcastle had everything that was important in the Second World War. The industries that were making munitions and all sorts of things like helmets and rifles and everything you needed to run a war were done in factories that were here. The industries that were already here were converted to war factories. Newcastle made everything, including uniforms and even the dried food that was consumed by the troops on the front line, was manufactured in a factory in Morpeth and shipped out on refrigerated barges made by local manufacturer Ganinans. The deep water port was carrying coal. All the ships used were coal-fired ships, so coal was absolutely critical. The state dockyard was the dockyard that all the vessels that were damaged were brought here to be repaired. The Air Force base was here. Everything that you needed to run a war in Australia was centred here in Newcastle. So they put a military installation on a major scale. It was frightening, it really truly was, even as a kid. All this stuff they were putting in to protect the wire fence, the tank traps, and doing tests and all these guns and that, oh, it was frightening. For a city of less than 100,000, we had a lot of protection. In addition to the five army bases, we had two naval bases, four forts, two RAF bases, seven anti-aircraft batteries, tank traps, radar, this was enormous. Never told since then, but when you look around at all of the bases, this was a military establishment on a major scale. And that's why the Japanese came here and shelled the place, because this was the place to be at. We now know that the Japanese never really intended to invade us. Australia is far too big to hold. But because of our industries and our coal, they did attack us. They sank 39 ships off our coast, and for the people of Newcastle, that threat was real. I think if they wanted to make an effect, they would have grabbed the port of Newcastle. It was the only thing that would have uh, damaged Australia in the war to a serious degree. And that was because they had shipbuilding, ship repair, which is more important that people forget about that, deep water harbour and the stairworks. So it, it was a strategic thing. And all they'd have to do is grab the port and hold it. They could be here for years. We wouldn't have been able to dislodge them at all. Newcastle Steelworks at the start of the war in 1939 was the biggest steel plant in the British Empire. Essingham Lewis was a great man. Back in 1936, he said, war clouds are gathering over Europe and we must do something about it now. So ferro alloys we bought from South Africa and he quickly thought, well, they're in danger, those ships with submarines in the Indian Ocean. You better make them. The other major item was tungsten carbide, of course. We imported all our tungsten carbide from Germany. Well, he said, get in and make it. And by the end of 1939, our group of qualified people had produced tungsten carbide here and supplied all the ordnance factories in Australia to turn shell casings and gun barrels and everything. Bulletproof steel was made. It was a hell of a thing to make. Some hairy moments making high alloy steels because of the 
additional temperature you needed. And if you had any weakness in your refractory lining, steel would just pour out on the floor at your feet, <laughs> which happened a few times. We made thousands of tonnes of shell-grade steel and we had the shell annex at the works, manned by women, 24 hours a day, on lathes, just turning shell cases. So we're making 300 tonnes a day at one stage, shell steel. Then it was a matter of supplying the right steel to the subsidiaries, like the bulletproof with Lysas plate, Stuart and Lloyd's gun barrels, because they rolled tubes, they had that technology. Desperate for small arms to defend the nation, up suddenly came the invention of the lightweight, extremely reliable Owen submachine gun, ideal for jungle warfare. It was the only such weapon to be wholly designed and manufactured in Australia. It was produced by Lysart's factories in Newcastle and in Port Kembla. We were often called on because of the high tonnage required to do something that had never been done in open hearth before. At one stage we made cylinders for the boomerang fighters that we made down there. Well, did we have some trouble with that? We had to go to very high temperatures to melt all these alloys. The roof of the furnace was made of large silica bricks. They got very hot, of course, and but at these very high temperatures, they actually melt. You look at the roof and you see salictites, <laughs> and you start to worry. <laughs> During the war, my grandfather was in charge of a project where they were required to build 175 foot long tugboats, 50 for the US Army and 50 for the Royal Navy. My granddad had to design a production line alongside the Hunter River, so a 75 foot tugboat was launched every two weeks to keep up with the demand from the US and the English navies to provide the tugboats that went up into the Pacific Islands. The Japanese knew a lot about the BHP, there was a rumour that Mr Menzies had escorted them round the BHP long before they entered the war. He had the nickname of Pig Iron Bob because just before the war apparently he sent all this scrap iron to Japan which people said came back then in the form of shells. During World War II there was a Japanese submarine that let the midget submarines into Sydney Harbour but on its way up the coast it laid off Newcastle and dropped a line of shells some exploded in the city and, and a couple exploded out on the stoolworks. We woke up this June winter night in 1942 and hear this and we all go outside with Dad and Mum. It's about two o'clock and we hear boom, boom and Dad thought, we all thought with Dad, that it was our guns practising. Mm. But there was one puzzling thing. The sky was lit up brilliantly. You could, we could see the stoolworks, searchlights, star shells, a couple of odd noises which alarmed me a bit and I thought this is more than an exercise. So I hair-tailed it back down to the small laboratory on the end of the department. And just as I got there, a phone rang. So I answered the phone. Hello, hello, would you please tell your foreman to that we are under attack and to black out all the furnaces. I felt like saying, that's like painting the Harbour Bridge. <laughs> well, the submarine attack came as a complete surprise to everybody. The lights were on sort of thing, it was in the morning. Parnell Place was a bit of a mess with the shell landing in the road there and uh, shattered windows and God knows what. The gunners said it was extraordinarily accurate shelling. It landed just inside the placements, etc. The Japanese knew what they were firing at. They were after the steelworks. My dad was Martin John Laffey. He was a master gunner first class. He received a phone call from here, tell him the circumstances, so he put his uniform over his pyjamas. He was the only guy that had the key to the ordnance to fire the guns. There were a whole lot of complications. Where the submarine was originally couldn't be seen from Fort Scratchley because it was blocked by nobbies. The submarine drifted, which brought it into range. They fired the two guns. It showed that he was a master gunner first class because the first shot that he fired nearly sank the sub. It went pretty close because they stopped firing and they submerged after four shots. 
thought Wallace from memory had a, a larger, more destructive gun, but they knew enough to come in literally under the radar. So the big gun at Fort Wallace couldn't depress low enough to fire. So it fired, it fired across the top of the sub. A lot of this was known by the authorities that there could be trouble because uh, say in the middle 30s, uh, Japanese ships would come here and, and they'd hire the only cab in Newcastle and have it for the day, these poor seamen. And they'd go around and they used to get themselves photographed against military installations. They would actually photograph what, what the fort was and how many paces it was and that sort of stuff. So when the Japs fired, they could get almost pinpoint accuracy and they would have knocked out the guns if they'd been there another two or three minutes probably. It appears that the Japanese had 1938 British Admiralty charts. It has Japanese writing and information and so on over it. It extends from Tomari to Wollongong and we have a second one which covers the port of Newcastle. That was the one that they were working on when the I-21 submarine attacked Newcastle. We didn't get the all clear till 6 a.m. There would have been 70 or 80 blokes down in air raid shelter, most of them having a good sleep. People were fearful, but they accepted it after a few days, as people do. It's very popular in hindsight to say that Japan never intended to invade us, that the threat wasn't real. But it was real. They were here, bombing our harbour. The Fortress Newcastle concept was about the centre of the industries in the, around the harbour and around Newcastle. The major guns were at the four forts that all had six inch or nine inch guns. The northern one was Tomaree, Fort Tomaree, up on the headland at the entrance to Port Stephens. And the six inch guns there were to protect from the north and to protect the entrance to Port Stephens. To control the vessel movements and in and out and around Port Stephens, they needed a basically a control tower, I guess you could say. There were a number of gun placements at the base of Tomari, including a uh, torpedo launching platform, so that they could fire torpedoes from the land at any invading vessels. And on the opposite hill, on Yakabar, uh, they had a fake gun, a big piece of pipe sticking out uh, to sea. During the Second World War, Australia had a very close alliance with America. The American army made an agreement with the Australian government to allow Port Stephens to be taken over by the Americans as an American base. The Australian component was called HMAS Assault. Thousands and thousands of Australians were trained, but also hundreds of thousands of Americans were trained in landing craft, in jungle warfare, there was a major military operation around the beaches of Port Stephens. During the war they had about 50,000 troops, English and Australian and American troops up in uh, Port Stephens. They put the road in, a tarred road into Nelson's Bay, which they didn't have. Before they came here, people that wanted to go to Nelson's Bay used to go up to Tillagary Creek, get in a ferry, then go up to Nelson's Bay by water. This. Uh, New road made it easier for the troops to come down without permission to the nurses' quarters and to the dancers at, at Stockton. A couple of Americans got killed in a jeep halfway to Nelson's Bay and they hit a cow. So they sent a, a message through to all the farmers to keep the cows off the road or they'll go through and machine gun the cows. All of the coast from Port Stephens down to Newcastle was protected. They thought the Japanese was going to blow up the BHP. They were going to land at Nelson's Bay and then move their way down. So they formed a defence line, a northern defence line, through the tops of the hills there with barbed wire. What it did, it went from the river to the beach. I would say it'd be eight or ten metres wide and it'd be three metres high. It was just entanglement and there were little tracks through it for the golf links for the golfers to go through. Uh, yeah, I know. That was, there was a sign on it saying, uh, Japanese not allowed in these little tr little tracks, you know what I mean? Oh, it was sort of thing, yeah. They had a bridge there, and they set explosives on the bridge, so if the Japs come through, they can blow the bridge up. Through the bush, they had machine guns nests. And they built these two massive big wooden guns, they, barrels on them as big as telegraph poles to point up in the air for the Japanese to think that they were guns sort of thing. They did look real and they were big. There were a number of 
fake guns around Newcastle. There were two lots in New Lambton and they were set out in the triangular shape and with a, uh, a mock building and so on uh, in the background of them and they were basically wooden. All of the coast was considered to be where they were coming from. So virtually every piece of the coast had tetrahedrons, large concrete triangular structures at regular intervals placed so that no vehicle could come in from the water. This was taken on the beach where we were camped and we were surrounded by these tank traps with a barbed wire through them. We didn't do much swimming because you had to go through the barbed wire to get into the water. The next fort was Fort Wallace. Fort Wallace was the most significant in that it had a nine inch gun, the biggest of all the guns, and uh, it could fire an incredible distance out to sea. And it had a, a clear and open span for all of the coast north and south of the whole area. And it was carefully set up to be the major protective fort for Newcastle. They installed radar at Fort Wallace and we were the ones that were chosen to do the course. Shepherd's Hill radar was the first radar set up in Australia. They set up the three radar bases to get a radar pattern for the entire of the fortress area. So each had their role. Japanese shipping going up and down the coast, we'd see, instead of looking at it, we were, had our backs to it looking at the screens and we couldn't believe it. No one had ever thought of those kind of things. Later in 1942, Ash Island radar was set up to provide coverage for Williamtown on their own planes and of course the potential of anyone else that was coming. So it was searching the skies. Ash Island was a little bit out of the way and had quite a large WAF contingency down there. Now the girls used to like to party on Friday and Saturday nights and they would walk back into Raymond Terrace to go to the army camp and go out with the guys there. Then we saw 208 radar station down at mine camp at Swansea come online. It was searching the skies and giving guidance to the planes that were coming and going from Rath Mines. One of the interesting things about mine camp was how they camouflaged the buildings. They made it look like a normal street with normal houses along the side so that people wouldn't realise what was going on down there. Two big 40 foot towers was a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> and after the war, the uh, towers just disappeared and they made houses out, made five houses out of them. Fort Scratchley is famous in Australian history as being the only location in Australia that guns fired on an enemy vessel. Fort Scratchley had been built way back into the 1800s to protect Newcastle from an expected Russian invasion a long time prior, but they re-established the two six-inch guns there and, and increased the establishment at Fort Scratchley quite significantly. The arrangements at Nobby's were controlled from Fort Scratchley. The searchlights were controlled from there as well. A number of troops that used to be here in their different regiments, engineers and grenadiers and what have you, and the place was alive. There were infantry, there were obviously the gunners and so on, most of whom were militia or reservists, and there were some permanent army staff as well as a lot of AWARS. Catalina photo from May 1942 shows the fort with the observation tower, the guns, and no evidence of any camouflage, whatever. On the night of the attack, the fort was in its pristine state sort of thing. The later photo in December of 1942 shows the fort fully camouflaged. It made the place look like uh, there wasn't a fort at all. There were additional buildings uh, put up. They were all built from masonite. The observation post was made to look like about a three-storey house. Each of the six-inch guns had a metal frame with a small house and they were on rails so that the house could be pushed aside so that the guns were free to be fired and so on. The last of the four forts, Park Battery, is the most important of the whole lot. It is the only place ever in Australian history that the three armed forces all had a headquarter operation together in the one building 
for the united purpose of protecting the one place. And of course the master gunner's cottage that's still there was one of the many buildings that they built there as the command centre for Fortress Newcastle. It was Dobson's main location. Uh, Colonel Dobson was the commander of the heavy coastal defences for the Second World War. So there's a large myth about tunnels in Newcastle that the all of the forts are joined by tunnels. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, there's a big body of water. You would have to go particularly deep under some coal mines to get from Fort Wallace to Fort Scratchley. The forts each have a tunnel network. So yes, there are tunnels. And up at uh, the top of King Edward Park, there's tunnels through the hill for where the searchlight batteries were. So we do have extensive tunnels, but they don't link to each other. We were looking out our top bedroom window one night and it was all pitch black and we could see the searchlights crisscrossing the sky and I can remember that really vividly. Searchlights were an important part of the facility, either out to sea or up into the air to search for any, any invaders. So along the coastal front uh, there are quite a few and there are remnants of many of the searchlight bases. So perched on the side of the hill below Streslecki Lookout still is a concrete bunker that the searchlight was in. Around this city, almost in a, in a semicircular arc from Port Stephens down to the bottom of Lake Macquarie, there were thousands and thousands of people in camps everywhere. There were roaming batteries of guns on the back of vehicles. Clearly people would have seen that as being, there must be a problem. We had night after night on red alert, sitting in the concrete gun pit, not knowing whether it was planes or submarines, but everyone was ready to go, whatever we had to do. The RAAF obviously had to be involved and they needed to establish a base, so they chose the site at Williamtown, specifically to be part of the fortress. And Williamtown was a very basic installation, a bit of flat ground and a few tin sheds. After Newcastle was shelled by I-21 in 1942, uh, the base then realised that there was a growing need to defend Newcastle in different ways. They set up as a training base and so we had operational training units who were at Williamtown throughout that period. They needed to practice their air-to-ground gunnery and bombing, so ranges were set up along Stockton Bight, Fullerton Cove, where the uh, pilots could practice dropping their weapons. Now these targets usually included things like trucks, tanks, old aircraft. Uh, there were numerous accidents in the early days, especially in the war when training was quite rapid to get the guys on the front line as quickly as they could. And of course, with a lot of aeroplanes, they were only single seat aeroplanes, so there was no room for an instructor in there as well. So the guys were basically teaching themselves how to fly. The base in 1942 was handed over to the American Army Air Corps, who were staging through here with P-40 Warhawks on their way to Darwin to defend the north of Australia. When you look at the way that field has expanded, both militarily and commercially, now Newcastle has a fantastic international airport and it all came out of Fortress Newcastle. And of course, the Air Force base at Rathmines was their other big area they were protecting. Essendon Lewis, the uh, head of BHP, was one of the only ones saying originally, we've got to defend Australia. So he was the guy that actually got into the steel industry, got to making guns, etc. They looked around and in 1939 they came here, they took about uh, 35 hectares. It was the largest flying boat based in the Southern Hemisphere. It was the flying boat centre. It was the centre. Over 3,000 personnel served at Rathmond towards the end of the war. A total of 168 cats came through the base. It was primarily a training base, that is training pilots to learn to fly the cat. The water is always quite navigable there. It's close to Newcastle and it's close to Sydney. The Catalina was designed first of all in America they are a boat, basically, with a huge wing, 102 feet. It's a very, very huge wing. They had enormous range, endurance, 15, 18 hours. Very important with the range of things they could do, from mining harbours to dropping bombs, rescuing of crews, and also supporting the forces on land, resupply, food for the coast watchers. On the first day of arrival at uh, Rathmines, we're getting off the bus and there was a corporal there, you, you, you and you, 
uh, are down for a, a duty tomorrow at the cemetery because a plane has crashed and uh, you will be the pallbearers. A plane with a very experienced senior pilot was training a new group to do these dangerous open sea landings just off Nobby's head. Unfortunately, there were only two out of the whole crew who were saved, so we were sent as the, the duty for the burial service the next day. It was a, a pretty rude awakening. World War II also had its bizarre side. Future um, Archibald winner, uh, artist, uh, Sir William Dobell, first dug trenches at Rathmines other than the left base. He and others in the camouflage unit were soon painting uh, fake farm scenes to disguise military installations from the prying eyes of the low-flying Japanese aviators. The fortress area went inland as far in as Singleton. You need to spread your forces away from the centre. If the, if the centre is attacked, you need to have forces further out around the boundary. So they created specifically army bases and anti-aircraft bases as far away as Singleton. There were five different army bases scattered around the outskirts. We had Singleton, Largs, Rutherford, Raymond Terrace and Greta. Greta Camp was established particularly as a training base for soldiers, for the army, and in its heyday it was a major, major army training camp. After the war from 1949 to 1960, the original Greta Army Training Camp was repurposed as a processing facility for migrants and displaced persons, basically refugees escaping the horrors of the Second World War. During its 11 years, 100,000 people passed through that camp and around 10,000 babies were born. These people later entered Australian communities and helped forge the Australian nation. Singleton was established further inland. It exists still today as one of our most significant army bases in Australia. So again, Fortress Newcastle and its day has turned into a major important Australian army base. There were a whole series of anti-aircraft batteries established, both permanent and mobile. There's a couple of great big concrete buddy dinghies that they put ACAC guns on top of it. And my uncle, Eddie Chapman, used to man them and there were, they had quarters out there for them to live in, to sleep in. And they used to tow a target over the top of them, heading towards which the Japanese would have done, head towards the BHP. And these ACAC guns, you could hear them from here, and they'd be, and they'd be firing at the target sort of thing. And this went on a, a fair bit. We did the technical work on what was called a height and range finder and what they called a predictor. We got the guns aligned to the target and then we would call fire. I'm here. You can see from the fort outline how much effort they put into considering all the potential ways that an enemy could attack the centre. So from the north, from the west, from the east in particular, but also from the south. So what they did in the south, they, they figured that there was a very narrow point of land between the ocean front and Lake Macquarie. And in that narrow point of land was the most suitable spot that they could defend any attack from the south. So at Coltee Creek, they established what's known as the Southern Defence Line, a complete barrier of barbed wire. In the afternoon on the way home, while attending the uh, primary school, we used to pass Anderson Hill, and it was honeycombed with tunnels and the army was there. The soldiers used to take us down through the tunnels, show us around that. In the trenches they had machine guns, they had bring guns on tripods. They were guarding the road. There was a timber bridge built that they could demolish in one moment. They would prevent any attack from the south. And they were putting a, a canal through there to the ocean. And the idea was that if the Japanese got to Sydney or uh, Newcastle and they had ships going past, They'd have the Swansea Channel blocked off and you wouldn't be able to get out there and you wouldn't be able to get out of Newcastle, you know. So there was another way of attacking the Japanese was torpedo boats from Rathmines that come across the lake through that canal into the ocean 
and they could intercept the Japanese that were going past. Well, they were digging all that out at the time, but finally the, the war ended, so it was just gone and forgotten. Down as far as the radar station at Catherine Hill Bay, and of course, Rathmines was their other big area they were protecting, but it was the southern aircraft area and the northern aircraft area at Williamtown. So again, south and north of the main production facility. So really it was a big arc around the city. Most people know about the Japanese attack on Sydney Harbour, but what they might not know is that Australia gave the Japanese submariners a full military funeral. Yeah, I was one of the, the pallbearers at the funeral of the uh, four Japanese submariners. And they buried them at Eastern Suburbs Crematorium and gave them full naval honour funeral with the hope that by doing so, the Japanese would show a little bit more leniency as far as our prisoners of war which had been taken. Unfortunately, didn't make a bit of difference to them. We, we all know the story of the atrocities of the Japanese during World War II. The Japanese submarines went, went into Sydney Harbour, the surprise attack, on Sunday the 31st of May. Those midget submarines were somehow carried on the backs of mother submarines who discharged the midget submarines once they reached outside Sydney Heads. The mother submarine went to work plundering shipping along the east coast of Australia, particularly between Sydney and Newcastle. And only three days later, a BHP ship, the Iron Chieftain, was torpedoed. she just left Newcastle with a load of coal bound for Melbourne. The Navy stopped all ships leaving port and all ships could not sail independently. They had to sail in convoy. So a convoy headquarters was established in Newcastle at HMAS Maitland. Port of Newcastle. Ships move out to join a convoy as it steams along the coast. Out to sea, a grim hunter waits for its prey. I was on a ship in the second convoy. We sailed out of Newcastle. There were 14 ships in the convoy. One of the ships, a ship called the Guatemala, was a bit slow leaving port. The Commodore said, I can't afford to stop out here outside Nobby's for fear of being picked off by Japanese submarines. So the 13 ships with the Guatemala, we could see it coming down the Hunter at one o'clock the next afternoon when she was just off door head. She was torpedoed and sunk. That was my first night at sea. <laughs> that was a great start. <laughs> I'd been, been at sea four hours and we'd already lost a ship in the convoy. The submarines operated on the Australian coast for the next 18 months. They come and go, come and go, and they did uh, quite a bit of damage. Despite all the efforts of the Navy, losses in ships and men were severe. People had no idea about the number of ships that went down from the East Coast because it was, sh you know, sh um, you know, even if Dad was coming home, don't tell your girlfriends. You couldn't even tell your girlfriends. There was a, a very special purpose and a very special routine to operate if you were if you were in trouble, if you were attacked. Frigates of the RAN, newly built in Australian dockyards, shepherd the convoy. More than 60 corvettes were built in Australia for this purpose. And the one thing that we knew about the convoys was only the escort ships were allowed to pick up survivors because they were quick. The Iron Crown was travelling with a full load of iron ore bound for Newcastle when off Gabo, the south coast, she was torpedoed 
and sunk very quickly. And I can remember my father saying, um, he was in a convoy when the Iron Crown went down. And I can remember him saying one minute it was there and the next minute it was a ball of smoke. And the horrible thing was they had to do full steam ahead and not stop. Iron ore was a very dangerous cargo, particularly when you're on the ship, which is torpedo, because she went up in a mass of red dust. And when the, when the, when the air cleared, there was nothing left, left of the ship. 36 of them went down with the ship, 16 survived. The Iron Knight, my father had been relieving on it. A lot of the engineers were young men who came from Wickham. They had called them the Wickham Boys or the Carrington Boys. Um, you know, some only 17 if they were junior engineers. And I came home from, from school one day, from primary school, and I could see I get quite emotional with this because I, I could see my father crying. And uh, Mum said, leave your dad alone. She said, it'll be okay. And every engineer was lost on the Iron Knight and Dad knew them all, young men, some of them, uh, because the engineers were down in the engine room. The Japanese were extremely accurate with their firing. Many of the world's largest ships became troop ships during the war. And of course, we've got the story of the Centaur, the hospital ship. It was torpedoed in the middle of the night uh, with a loss of 268 lives, ablaze with light, with red crosses marked all over it. And that was, was sunk by one of the big submarines. In the end, the Japanese sank 39 ships off Australia during World War II, one third of those off the coasts of Newcastle and Sydney, with around 1,200 lives lost. So the war was definitely on our doorstep. If you read the Australian press, we, we'd sunk Japanese submarines every week for the next goodness knows how long. But in actual truth, at the end of the war, it was established that we didn't sink a Japanese submarine not one. But you had to keep up the morale of the people in those days and the, you, you got fed a lot of information which, which was a long way from the truth. The convoys which were sailed up and down the coast, their aerial escort was the Catalinas which could patrol mainly around Sydney and Newcastle from their base at Rathmines and they did a very good job. The flying boats from, from Rathmines went way up to New Guinea in overnight flights. They did work all around Australia. They, on patrol, located the Japanese fleet sailing down to take over Indonesia, New Guinea, whatever. So, a vital role. Our primary aim was to do this deep sea mining. And uh, the issue was you had to be down at about 100 feet, tree level, come in at night over a port and drop 2,000 pound mines, which proved itself to be a very valuable control of Japanese fleet movements to the extent that ultimately they were almost unable to operate until they were sure that, that the mines had been cleared away. At its peak, about 9.45, there were about 3,000 personnel here. It would have been a big target. There's a persistent story that the Japanese had a submarine based around Spoon Rocks at Swansea, and it was there and used to surface because they found tin cans and all sorts of stuff, they washed ashore. So the, the threat was very real, and I think that someone was actually within Catherine Bay was, was uh, sending out a, a signal to the submarine out off the, off the coast. The military has the techniques of not telling the people what they're doing, ever, any time. Uh, a, they can't spread information if they don't know it, but B, the military have their own way of doing things. There was a decision made that I understand took place between the military part of the government and the board of BHP at the time, that the steelworks at Newcastle was not to fall into the hands of the enemy. Growing up 
hearing my grandfather talk about, he was called into a meeting and he was told because he had had so much involvement in the construction of the plant from when he started working there in 1923, he had to work out how to destroy it and destroy it to the point that it could not be rebuilt easily and could not be used. The plant was broken up into a timing chart and there was a sequence and the procedures of where explosives were placed to flatten the blast furnaces, flatten the coke ovens. And after he had done that, he was then seconded to the military and taken around all of the industries in Newcastle and basically wrote the procedures to flatten Newcastle. Places like the lamp works, it was just flog the machines with a sledgehammer, the gas holders at the back of Ties Hill were going to be blown up, the walls were going to be blown up. He was so concerned about it that he, at the time they were living at New Lampton and they had a weekender out at Pelican so he picked his family up and moved them out to Pelican for a fair part of the duration of the war. That happened and you think about it today and go, wow, they were actually going to blow the whole place up, not just the steelworks, flatten Newcastle's industry. The industries were tasked with making special munitions out of steel that wasn't made previously in Australia. They needed to make bullets that could pierce through armour plating, special steels. They needed to make plate for vehicles that would not be pierced by bullets. So the research that was being done at the steelworks and other subsidiary industries about special steels was very important but new work. So those products were handed to the military testing people and they built a special place at Fern Bay for the testing of these products that were made locally called the Armour Proof Range. I've been chasing up photos of, of uh, the Proof Range during the war and it's been very hard because it was a, it's a hush out secret place during the war and I'd say that's why we haven't got any actual photos. Most people wouldn't have a clue what was going on. Of course I was here and in, right in the middle of it, I used to walk out there when I was about 10 year old. As this bloke said, was there any security? I said, none. I said, just go in, you'd talk to them and they'd show you the big guns and they'd pull a big truck out sort of thing and they'd blow the truck to pieces and oh, it was scary. It was really scary, honestly. You'd, you'd think, holy dooly, like what what's gonna happen next? On the main targets, they had 200 millimeter plate they were testing. The shells they were firing were four inch shells and you can see how they've actually punched right through the 200 millimetre plate. It's just unbelievable. They just fire at a target to see how accurate the, the guns were. The main centrepiece, they actually filled it with sand and sawdust and they'd fire the shells into that and then dig the shells out of that and, and see what's happened to that. I mean, it must have been a horrifyingly dangerous place with all these pieces of steel being forcibly very close projected into other pieces of steel. All the shells they fired in this place was all inert, but they have fired high explosive shells from the proof range over onto the beach itself. They used to hit the target, and if they wasn't dead accurate with them, they'd ricochet off and they'd land up out the back. So we used to pick them up as kids, a 10 year old, and bring them home, and we had them in the backyard. Oh, I'll never forget it, 10 year old, and what do we use? I can still see myself doing it. Get a hammer, and the point of the of the big shell, we would tap it, and you'd unscrew it, and I'd, we'd say to each other, "Oh, look at the sand we're tipping out of it." We didn't know it was even gunpowder. Well, it was only ten year old, eight year, yeah. And then my uncle, when he came out the house one day, and he saw the shells, well, man, he, I can see him now. He was huffing and puffing and jumping up and down, and he said, get these things out of here. I can still hear him saying it. And what we did, we carried them from there across to the river here, put them in a rowboat, rowed across the river, and I think we had about six or seven of these big 25 pounders and threw them in the, in the, in the river. Yeah, yeah, alive. Like not, yeah, like, wow, scary. Just in recent years that they wanted to put a housing commission place through here and they were checking out where the live rounds and they've actually found live rounds out here. They got 185 SES to go out and look for them and they found 28 live ordinances and then blew them up where they found them and the noise was hideous. We could hear it here as plain as can be. It was, oh it was frightening. 
So once the Second World War was underway, with 700,000 men at the front lines, the women were basically called upon to take over the running of the country. They ran the farms, they ran the factories, they ran the public infrastructure. It was just immense. I'm Grace Jones and I was here at Fort Scratchley in uh, 1944, right through to about 1946. When we joined up, we understood that when we joined, we were taking a man's place, and we did take a man's place. To think that we had 18-year-old girls in charge of protecting our infrastructure here, a BHP, you know, manning the guns, 18-year-old girls there to protect the port of Newcastle is just astonishing. When we got to Wave Battery, the men were pretty aghast. They couldn't believe that women were coming in to do the same job. When Rathmines found out that it was the girls that were going to do it, every pilot turned in sick that morning. <laughs> the CO promised them there would be no difference in the chores. So we did exactly the same as the men. And we got a lot of respect for that too. We weren't treated as women. So that was the first day that I realised I was going to be a gunner. I think my dad was very proud. He and two brothers and five first cousins all went to the First World War and, and they were all gunners. We did everything and we were just camped on the beach. We lived on the sand, we ate sand, we slept sand. One shower, 30 girls trying to get a shower together. <laughs> and that was the funniest part of the day. Around this city, there were thousands and thousands of people in camps everywhere. You'd go down in, into uh, Newcastle and the place was covered in Yanks. Like, you know, there was Yanks everywhere. These Yanks came up and uh, they brought us up chewing gum and Coca-Cola in a green bottle and gave it to us. So we thought they were a great, great place. We hadn't seen chewing gum till the Americans came. I'd always wanted chewing gum. In Stockton was a, a family called Sands, and they were all boxers. They used to train in Newcastle Beach, and uh, a lot of the Yanks used to uh, interfere with the uh, women there, sort of, you know. And there was a lot of Yanks woke up next morning and found themselves on the beach, because these Sands used to go along and build them all up. So I used to clean the beach up for them. We, when we got out on leave, we'd make for one of the pubs, Newcastle. She, she was a very wild old town during the war. Every two months, a band would come and none of the men at WAVE were given leave over that night. And all the girls had to go because Link only had men. So we used to go and dance. <gasps> My, you know, we did the jitterbug under, under the legs and over the shoulders. And, oh, I've never seen dancing like it. And that was one of the highlights. Everybody went to the Palais. Yeah, the Palais. It was a rough old place too, but there were places of entertainment. Once the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbour, the public works built in the school holidays. They built trenches in all the schools in Newcastle. You had air raid practice at school. The whistle blew and you knew you had to go to the air raid shelter. Everyone had a war satchel, every student. And in your satchel, you had an enamel pannikin. You had a soup cube, which I always wondered what you did with it because I'd never seen a soup cube. And in that bag was a, um, a, a rubber to place between your teeth and we had cotton wool to put in your ears. And at 11 o'clock every morning, the Catalina would come over pretty low over the school. They'd blow a whistle. We'd have to run out and jump into the trench while the Catalina went over. We had a good looking, uh, good looking teacher. One day we had a, a, a male teacher arrive there. And I think to impress the, our teacher, one morning he sang out, righto kids, follow me. And he said, he jumped into the trench to show off. But when he came to the service, he looked like the creature from the Black Lagoon. It was full of mud and water. 
us kids near died, died of laughter. Dad was a warden. I think he had to go around and make sure people had their no lights showing. He had his tin hat and his gas mask. You had to have coupons for so much meat a week and so much sugar and butter and stuff like that. I remember going home and our house had been broken into and I can remember a big policeman standing in our lounge room. Our coupons had all been stolen. So that's, that's, I can still see that big policeman standing there. At WAVE, there probably was 10 or 12 married, all successful, no divorces. Maybe the atmosphere of being at war, wanting to have something permanent and sustainable, they really made it something special. In all of my lifetime, I've never understood the war period. But all of the people that I speak to who are older than me, they talk about the fear, the terror that they understood at the time their life was at threat. And it was real to them, but it's never been real to us ever since. Absolute fear. I can't believe that you could live being so absolutely frightened. And most of that was from not knowing what we were up against. 1945, VJ Day. Air Vice Marshal Jones, watched by Commodore Collins, RAN, signs the surrender document. And then the representatives of the Japanese government and armed forces come forward to sign. I was in first year at girls' high school and we were called to assembly and Mr Drake, the area director of education, was there at girls' high assembly hall. And he was there to tell us the war had finished. And look, it was absolutely, uh, we, we got the day off. <laughs> the war was over and um, there were all these black stockings running down National Park Street to go to the tram. And I just was in tears. I didn't want anyone to know I was in tears. And the French mistress came up and she said, Daphne, why aren't you running with your friends? And I could remember saying, I won't have to say goodbye to Dad anymore. Because we had all these goodbyes, you know, in, in the merchant shipping. Um, my girlfriends who hadn't seen their dads for three years, I used to envy them because they only had one goodbye. Um, and every goodbye you thought was the last.